So if it wasn't for COVID, hopefully all of you would be here. And here is the Western Maryland Research and Education Center. It's one of several research and education centers in the state. Most of the states have, besides having their universities, their land grant universities, they usually have research stations located around their state and the research stations tend to specialize maybe in some different things. So this is a picture of ours. It's about a 500 acre facility. Uh, Western Maryland, we're located just south of Hagerstown. If you're a Civil War buff, we're right kind of in and around the Antietam battlefield. A lot of different kinds of research are done here. Is done here, obviously the small ruminants, which we're gonna talk about. Uh, historically, uh, there was some work with uh, grazing dairy heifers. A lot of uh, forage variety trials were done. Of course, some of your typical agronomic research is done here with corn, soybeans, and small grains. Also a lot of horticultural crops. We also uh, have vineyards and uh, make wine. So we do a little bit of everything here, and we're gonna talk specifically about the small ruminant program. So I came to Western Maryland in the oh, early 2000s, and we, I was offered this site, which you can see pictured here. It was a 10 acre site that they had previously been grazing dairy heifers. Uh, they had divided into 10 uh, one acre paddocks. The additional two and a half acres is a silva pasture area with mixed uh, hardwoods and walnuts. That was used for some different purposes, but I believe some grazing also went out there. So we adapted this, this to work for small ruminants. That adaptation basically involved fencing. A lot of fencing that's quite suitable for cattle was not very suitable for small ruminants, both from a containment standpoint as well as a predator control standpoint. So we got our feet wet in 2004 with goats. And uh, this year uh, we have a land project. And I'm gonna talk about some of the things that we've done in between. So the very first year, we just kind of got our feet wet. Wanted to kind of test out our system, see how we were going to do things. In fact, some of the things we did that first year, we changed from. Uh, we initially used a lot of electric netting and moved shelters around. And after this first year, we decided to go to a permanent central laneway system. Uh, the goats were provided by Wagon Wheel Ranch in Mount Airy, Maryland. So that was the first year. No research, just kind of get us started. Uh, the second year, we cooperated with the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Uh, they had a study where they were looking at the performance of Katahdin lambs that had by, been sired either by Dorper, Texel, or Suffolk rams. And so we ran those wean lambs uh, at our research center when we helped them collect data. Basically, the results would be how you would have anticipated them. Uh, the Texel lambs were the heaviest muscle. They brought the most of the marketplace. The Suffolk lambs grew faster. The Dorpers and the Tons were kind of intermediate. One of the interesting things we noted from this research, not specifically proven, but general observation that those Texel sired lambs were more resistant to internal parasites. After the lamb study is when we started our meat goat performance test. We ran this for 11 years. Uh, we basically, consigners would, would bring bucks to the test and we would evaluate them for growth performance and different internal parasite parameters. We'd also scan them for carcass data and evaluate them for reproductive and breeding and structural soundness. The goal was to identify the top performing bucks each year, which is what we did. Over the 11 years, we tested 736 bucks. They were mostly Kiko, and they came from 100 consigners from throughout the United States, 19 states, from as far uh, east to west, uh, north to south. We sent bucks as far as California, we had consigners from as far as uh, Oklahoma. So it was a pretty uh, uh, involved program that we did for those 11 years. We took a year off and then, I'm sorry, before I jump to that, one of the things we observed in the buck test was that those bucks really weren't getting market ready off of that pasture diet because that was a pasture-based performance test. So we started doing a, a little study where we were comparing goats that we fed in a pen. We fed them hay and one pound of grain versus bucks that grazed alongside the bucks in the test on pasture. So we looked at their growth, their carcass characteristics, and their health characteristics. Bucks were provided by our consigners. Three out of four years that we did this program, uh, it was funded by the Maryland Grain Producers Utilization Board. Conclusion, the bucks in the pens were healthier, lower fecal egg counts, better FAMACHA scores. They grew faster, uh, they produced better carcasses, and they brought would have brought more money at the sale barn 
or for direct marketing, and so they were more profitable. There are a little bit of differences from year to year, but that was the basic conclusion. Then we took a year off and we did a two-year study where we compared ram weather and short scrotum rams. A short scrotum ram is a ram whose testicles you push up inside the body cavity and then you band and remove his scrotum. He retains his testicles, so he's still a male. He still has testosterone, but because the testicles are in his body and not in his scrotum, with a temperature difference, he is infertile or should be infertile. So we looked at growth, carcass, and reproductive characteristics of these lambs. The lambs were provided by Shepherd's Manor Creamery, a sheep dairy in New Windsor. One of the things that grew out of this project were a couple of youth programs. One was an entrepreneurship program. Last year, we got the pelts from all of these lambs and the kids uh, sold them. And they learned all about developing their own business. We also, not we, but our 4-H people developed a research academy where the kids work with us on this research program. They're doing that again this year, but both of those programs came out of this uh, lamb study. Uh, and the other neat thing that came out of this study was that the, the lambs were purchased by the University of Maryland and the lamb was served in the dining halls on campus. The conclusion of this study was that the ram and short scrotum rams grew faster than the weather rams and they produce leaner carcasses. The negative side of being leaner, however, is that at the weights that we finished this study, uh, more of the ram and short skirt and rams fail to great choice, which in a commodity marketing situation would be problematic. Of course, that could be rectified simply by feeding them longer. From a reproductive standpoint, the short skirt and rams had very similar mating behavior, just as strong a libido as the rams. Uh, they definitely had compromised uh, production of sperm. The first year, there were no viable sperm in the short scrotum rams. The second year, there was one ram that kind of skewed the data because he had a few viable sperm. Okay, that leads us to, to this year. And for this year, I made a short video, and I hope that uh, it works from a technological standpoint. I hope the quality is good, and uh, it kind of explains this year's study, and then I'll go into the data after I finish the video. So hopefully, is the video working okay? Yes, it is. I thought you might enjoy seeing uh, the lambs, seeing the pastures, um, and I thought the video might be the best way to, to show it. And it kind of summarizes, like I said, how we try to put this study together. There again is the system we have to work with. So first step was to mow some lanes to put the fencing up. And there's Amanda, Jeff, and Nina Price. She's a young lady, you can see her on the right. Uh, she takes care of the lambs on a daily basis, so she helps set it up. So basically try to divide them into four paddocks for each lamb. So there's gonna be two treatment groups. The circle is the central laneway. And there's what's in the central laneway, a roof structure, water, minerals, um, shade and then the handling systems also situated under there. Pastures were established in the fall of 2018, one acre in 2019. There's the pasture mix that we have. When it comes up in the spring, there's just an awful lot of clover in there. This is a picture of the farm where the lambs came from in Pennsylvania. Hi, I'm Dan Turner with U Lamb Wright Farm in Shippensburg, Pennsylvania. We're going to be providing some ram lambs for a uh, forage study for the University of Maryland this year. We're taking 80 of our uh, 2020 ram lambs and they'll be doing a, a test where they're using forage as well as some grains and uh, comparing several of the growth traits and uh, health aspects of how they perform. This video is a little bit fuzzier, but this is unloading the lambs, obviously. So for 11 days, we just let them graze. Silva pasture area is a really nice place to start them out. Then they were split into two groups. We divided them by, sorted them by those data, and then I just went one, two, one, two, one, two, once I sorted them on those criteria. So this is the pasture group, a couple of shots. One of the ways I remember the groups is all the spotted lambs are in the pasture group and the only black lambs are in the other group. So here's the supplemented group. And as you can see, there should be three black lambs in there. That's how one of the ways, that, if I forget, I always can 
look at them. Again, there's Nina. She takes care of them. She feeds them once a day, checks their water. One pound of barley per day, whole barley, bought from a local farmer. And there you can see there's the, um, they do pretty good once they eat their grain, they, they go out and graze. And then Amanda, and I think sometimes with Nina's help, uh, moves the, the groups of lambs every week, they go to a different paddock. So they've gone back through, the, they've grazed the paddocks more than once, which might make you think there's gonna be a parasite problem, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. And here's Amanda and Nina bringing them in from one of the fields. Again, spotted lambs, so these are the pasture group. We work them every two weeks. In the beginning, we checked, uh, we, want, we checked once a week a couple of times. We had a few concerns, but normally it's just a, every two weeks we, we weigh them. This is our handling system. It works really well. Uh, this is the, we have a gathering pen, and then they're crowded, and they go into this. And they get really used to it, and, and they're really easy to work. 84. Weighs 105.6. So you, oh, you can see we use a platform steel for weighing it. Okay. Up so every way. lamb that comes off the, the chute and onto the platform, the platform is a scale and we weigh it in. Then we put them into the head gate so we can handle it easier. One of the things we check for is what's called body condition score. So we feel across the backbone and ribs, back and forth, and across the loin and the loin edge. This lamb's body condition score is about a three on a scale of one to five, with one being thin, three being average, and five being obese. Another score we look at is what we call a DAG score. And what a DAG score is, is we're looking to see if there's any evidence of scouring. You'd see fecal matter attached to the tail and you'd see it on the hocks. This lamb is very clean, so he's zero. He's got no fecal matter. Some lambs will be really covered. That scale goes from zero to five. The other thing we're going to look at is the FAMATRA score, a measure of anemia in the lamb. Anemia is the primary symptom of the barber pole, and it's the primary parasite that we use. So we use a little slogan called cover, push, pull, pop. So we cover the eye, push slightly, pull down, and then the membranes are exposed. And we're going to call him a FAMATRA 2. So he's not anemic, he's not in need of deworming. And so that's what we do with each and every lamb. We do this every two weeks. Okay. So sometimes we collect a fecal sample. When we collect a fecal sample on a, on a lamb that we need to know the individual animal whose feces it is, we collect it from the rectum. We need to use a glove, surgical glove. We put lubricant on it. <clears throat> Generous with the lubricant. And then we go into the rectum and we try to take it about four pellets out. Uh, sometimes it's really soft and you have to go in a couple of times. But we want to get somewhere between two and four grams of feces. These, this feces will be kept cool and it'll be shipped to a lab in Virginia and they will determine the number of eggs per gram of feces. So usually two to four grams of feces and then they count the number of eggs using a special slide. And the fecal egg count is an indication of the worm load that this lamb might have. Uh, it also indicates what his genetics for worm susceptibility is. Some of them can tolerate uh, worms better than others or l allow fewer of them to get established. Okay, so hopefully that video gave you <clears throat> a pretty good idea of how the, what the study involved. At least you can kind of picture what we've done. What I want to do is go through the data now. Um, this first slide uh, shows you basically the incoming data for these lambs. What they um, 
started the study at. So the lamps came on June 15th. So this is July, June 26th. So this is the start of the study. The acclimation period doesn't count. They were all grazing together. So as you can see, we've got about 40 lambs in each group. We were one short on the supplemented group. Very similar weights, uh, standard deviation about 14, 15 pounds. Uh, their, their growth during the acclimation period, again, very similar, a little over a half a pound a day. Uh, Famatra score is very similar. I'm gonna tell you that Famatra scores never were higher than three this entire time. So you can see those are pretty good Famatra scores, mostly ones and twos. Uh, probably a, um, the median was probably about two. You can see the body condition scores just under three. And you can see the fecal egg counts are really low. Consistent between the two groups of lambs, but also really low. 200 eggs per gram is not even enough uh, to do anything with in terms of uh, research or determining whether a anthelminthic is effective. I think you saw from the pictures that the pastures are pretty lush. They're pretty high quality. So Amanda work, has been working very hard collecting forage samples every single week. And so we have samples up through the end of August. And so there, this first graph shows the percent energy or TDN at those different stages. And so you can, you can just see that, and you're gonna see a similar trend in all of these graphs, that the pastures were really good quality when they started. Uh, they declined, we went through a dry period. Actually the lambs ate out most of the clover and chicory. And so the second time around they had a lot more grass. But as we got rainfall, you can see the quality of those pastures has improved. And you can see that uh, they're pretty consistent between the two groups. So she took samples from the pastures each of the two groups was uh, grazing. And keep in mind, what's gonna determine what a lamb gains per pound per day is a lot to do with the percent energy in the pasture. If we switch over and look at crude protein, again, you see a very similar um, pattern. And, and I can tell you that, that the pastures, the quality of the pastures now in terms of protein is way more than those lambs need. In fact, uh, pretty much, oh, it got a little bit low uh, on the third, July 20th, but generally speaking, I'd say all these protein levels are not only more than adequate for growing lambs, but it greatly exceed their requirements. Uh, there's a thing called relative feed value. It's used mostly in the dairy industry, but it looks like it looks at things like protein and, and energy, uh, the more sophisticated measures probably, but also looks at dry matter and comes up with a relative feed value. And the standard is alfalfa hay. So if you look, you look there, you can see that some of the time the pastures have exceeded the value of a full bloom alfalfa hay and at other times they've been a little bit below. But again, here in the last few weeks, the, the relative feed values are really, really high. To me, this is a lot more telling graph, this one right here, because what's happened over time, while those pastures are extremely high quality and have gotten to be very high quality, the percent of dry matter has gone way down. And I think we've seen that in, in these next couple of gra uh, graphs, I'm gonna show you how these lambs have been performing. And I think some of it can be explained by the very high amount of moisture uh, in these forages. So this is the body weights of the lamb. So, so again, they came in weighing about 66 pounds. And that first, the first um, section, of course, that is what they did during the uh, acclimation period. So we're starting with the second black dot. And as you can see, um, they've gained throughout uh, the study. They haven't lost weight, although, well, I shouldn't say that because the second time we wait, the, the first 11 days of the experiment or first 10 days after they came out of the acclimation period, the pasture only lambs lost uh, 0 0.0. Well, we'll see that in the next one, but you can see that they have gained steadily, but the, um, there's been a steadier gain in the supplemented ones and a kind of more of a leveling off in the pastured ones. So this shows average daily gain for each weigh period. And then the pasture lambs in green and the supplemented lambs in black. And you can see in the table, you can see each of their average daily gains. And one of the things that's, this is, we think it's kind of been unusual because the, the gains of the lambs in the pasture group, so just grazing, no supplement have been very erratic because they gained a half a pound in the acclimation period and then the first 10 days they lost 0 0.03 pounds per day. We were concerned, so we came back a week later to look at those lambs. They gained almost a pound 
per day. And I'm sure a lot of that was compensatory gain. Uh, then a week later, again, still concerned. Actually, we were concerned that those weights maybe weren't accurate. Uh, they gained over a pound that next week. So for the two, first two weeks of the experiment, the lambs on pasture gained, uh, or, or at, I shouldn't say the first two weeks. At, they lost weight the first 10 days, a little bit on average. Standard deviation is very large, meaning the lambs are gaining and lambs are losing. But the average, they were right around zero the second two weeks they gained a pound a day so pretty erratic and then they moved down to as you can see in the chart they went to 0 0.2 0 0.3 and then the last time we weighed they were down to 0.12 which isn't i don't think is obviously is very good the supplemented lambs so that first 10 days they gained a little bit of weight 0.19 they had been started on barley but obviously weren't up to a pound per day but we think that dry matter getting that dry matter in their belly really helped because we think it took 10 days, that those 10 days we had a lot of scours, a lot of dirty butts. I think 40% of the lambs had positive DAG scores. So 40% of the lambs had scours. And, uh, and the, again, the pastures were very nutritious, very high in moisture. So the, the supplemented lambs, again, they've had very erratic gains. The standard deviations on both sets of lambs have narrowed as, as we have gone through the experiment. They have narrowed because even the supplemented lambs had pretty large standard deviations, meaning lambs gained a lot or lost some, but they've been a lot steadier, the lambs that have gotten the barley. And, it's, and if we look back at the last graph, you can see it's only been since we weighed them last on the 31st that the supplemented lambs actually are now above the pasture lambs. And I suspect just looking at the lambs that that's going to continue because we've got such high moisture in these pastures. We've still got a lot of lambs that are, that are kind of loose. In fact, last night I went out at 10 o'clock because we were concerned um, Nina had seen a lamb that looked like it was bloating. And I didn't get the, without going into details, I didn't get her text until later. And so I went out there to make sure there wasn't a lamb that needed to be treated. And so I looked at the lambs and albeit it was in the dark, but they're still, they're still kind of, you know, loose. You can tell it's just, that moisture and that forage is, is playing a role. So we're gonna weigh them one more time. We're gonna weigh them on the, um, on the 14th, and then we're gonna scan them on the 25th. So then we'll have a complete set of data. And of course, we'll, uh, we'll statistically analyze it and look to see what, what we have. On the parasite side, the, the goal was to um, look at the effect of supplementation on parasites. But I can tell you, it, there's, there's gonna be no effect likely because there's no real issues with parasites. So we do FAMACHA scores every two weeks and you can see that they are usually uh, between one and a half and, and 2.2, never a FAMACHA score above three. We did deworm a couple of lambs occasionally because if I had a lamb with a FAMACHA score of three that lost weight, I'd go ahead and deworm that lamb. So if there were other criteria, we use the FAMACHA system to help us make deworming decision, but we also use what's called the five point check the five part check looks at the FAMACHA score, it looks for bottle jaw, we look at body condition score, we look at DAG score, we look at uh, a nose score as well. And so if a lamb is a three and he's scouring or a lamb is a three and he's lost weight, we'll go ahead and deworm that lamb. But overall, you can see pretty good FAMACHA scores. Uh, Barber pool worms definitely not having an impact in this study. If you look at fecal A counts, they came in really, really low. Um, for those of you who don't know much about how fecal A counts work, uh, the barber pole worm is an extremely prolific egg layer, so 2,000 eggs per gram isn't necessarily that high. So you can imagine 200 is very low. Uh, they've gone up a little bit, uh, but 575 is still low. In our buck test, that would be a gold buck, you know, the highest standard if he only had a 575 eggs per gram. Uh, and 371, they've gone back down. And the standard deviations are also pretty high, which which means really, you know, again, that you. Parasites are not a problem in this study. And so, um, you know, we're not really gonna be able to say anything about the effect of supplementation on parasites. So that's kind of going over the data really quickly. Uh, I think we're gonna have time for a quick question or two. And, and I must apologize, I was supposed to turn the program over to Michael to moderate. And so I will definitely turn it over to Michael at this point. Well, that was terrific, Susan, as always. 
those of you who know Susan won't be surprised to hear this, but Susan is nothing less than a national treasure. Um, and when you're talking sheep or goats with Susan, it's it's like hitting the mother load in a gold mine. So she really is, we're very fortunate to have her here in Maryland. So um, we're going to, we don't have any questions yet because people didn't know they were going to ask questions. So um, we're going to hold your questions till the end. But um, if you have any questions at any time, what we'd love you to do is go down to the bottom of your screen to the chat room. Just type in, in a question and you can send it to everyone or just to Michael Heller. And then we're going to ask questions you know, at the end of each presentation, but also we'll have time to ask questions of everybody at the very end. So um, first off, you should realize that in these three speakers today, I mean, we've got an amazing resource here in Maryland. Our, our farmers are so fortunate. It's, um, these guys are really the three musketeers of small ruminants and grazing. And um, the next one up is um, Jeff Semler. And um, I should say the incomparable Jeff Semler. Um, he is uh, one of the best raising specialists, um, not just in Maryland, but nationally. Uh, himself, he, he is a great beef grazer. Um, and he knows life histories of livestock breeds that I've never even heard of. I mean, he could tell you about a Dutch belted or about a belted Galloway and even where they each get their different belts. So he's an amazing, um, remarkable and delightful fella. Jeff, let's hear from you. All right, Michael, I'm going to try to share my PowerPoint presentation here if this works. Um, I always do that. Bear with me. Uh, helps if you start at the beginning. Yeah. All right, so that's the less professional way of doing that. Um, but as Michael said, I'm the county agent in Washington County. Um, I've been with Susan in the goat, goat slash sheep test for as long as it's been. Uh, I'm going to go over real quickly the grazing systems that we use and, and some of the forages and so on and so forth. So this is our um, silver pasture site that, that um, Susan talked about. Basically under those walnuts and other hard uh, woods, there's some uh, to the back there's oaks, but the, the picture you're seeing right now is their black walnuts. Uh, predominantly, we've got some switchgrass in there and fescue. Hey, Jeff. Um, yes. We're still seeing your um, PowerPoint, not the, f not the full screen. No, I'm seeing it on mine. Like it's still on the title page for us. Oh, it is? All right, hold on. Come on. All right, so we're gonna you share. Now what are you seeing? Now we see it, history of site, yep. Okay, now I gotta go all the way. Sorry about that. I'm much better live. Okay, so that's the silver pasture I was talking about. Black walnut trees, the, the, the tall grass behind those goats is uh, switchgrass, and then there's uh, forage, I mean, uh, tall fescue uh, in between the trees. So we uh, started out as, as Susan said, we adopted this pasture. A colleague of mine and I did some dairy heifer grazing there um, early in, or in the late 1900, uh, 1990s. Um, 
and or it would have been in the late 1900s. Anyway, um, that's a uh, novel end of fight fescue uh, in those in that pasture, and we have uh, worked through that uh, over the years. Use it using different forage varieties, which we'll talk about. Again, you can see that uh, pasture grass. It's a it's a wide bladed. It's one of the newer, or at that time, it was one of the newer uh, low end of fight no not a, um, or novel end of flight type fescues, but not what we have today. Um, again, there's just some uh, the, the uh, lambs grazing that fescue um, mid mid to late summer. You can see how stemmy it is. Uh, that's uh, one of our weed nemesis here in Maryland. That's perilla mint. You see the it's not uh, what we want in the pasture, and we'll talk about how we got rid of some of that stuff uh, a little bit later. We uh, did have one paddock that was uh, planted in forage uh, chicory, and uh, you can see some uh, bucklings going across that. Uh, that particular uh, chicory is a forage chicory from uh, New Zealand, and it is was developed for grazing. It's not just your average chicory that's in your front yard. We also had a, a two paddocks that we did use in summer annuals. So we tilled that and we planted our summer annuals in there. And we'll talk in depth about some of the summer annuals here in just a few seconds. So one of the things that we used, I used a mixture of sun hemp and millet. Um, I also used a mixture of millet and a brassica. And then we used a, another mixture of sun hemp, cow peas, uh, millet and sunflowers. So that's the sun hemp and millet after it was grazed. You saw the before picture a minute ago, and you can see that the goats did a fairly good job of grazing that. Uh, we did um, pull them out and rotate them, so we didn't let them graze it too short, but they surely did enjoy that uh, particular, those particular forages. Um, that's cow peas. As I said, we had a a mixture with that had the millet and cow peas in it um, and we'll uh, and they again those were some uh, for, forages that the goats really enjoyed because of their upright nature the way they grew again sun hemp um, you can see some brassica in that in that the foreground there in that uh, planting also some millet for those that aren't familiar with sun hemp it's a legume it is in the hemp family. It's fibrous. Um, it's a pretty little uh, yellow flower on it if it ever gets that uh, tall. And it's uh, we've I really liked it in my mixtures. Uh, before the we restarted our project, we renovated the entire field. So we were having uh, we were rotating between the warm season annuals and the cool season perennials with our goats for eleven years. And of course, we had the parasite issues with the goats later on and some weed issues. So I had the farm crew go in and uh, replant or plant all of the acreage except for the silver pasture and corn. Uh, so we could kill everything down, get rid of our weed pressure um, and rotate out for a year. We came back in the next year with oats. Uh, and that's the oats ready to graze right there. We used that first set of lambs that we had that you saw. Um, we grazed with, we grazed the oats with those lambs. And there are some of them right there. Um, it was interesting to watch, and I'll get to the grazing behavior in a little bit, but uh, the utilization of those oats was very, very uh, well done by the, by the lambs. Then uh, we rotated out of those oats and into this cool season perennial mix, which you see right here. It's basically meadow fescue. Um, it's got some uh, orchard grass, grazing orchard grass. It's got three different types of clover, um, arrow leaf, a red clover, and a white clover. And there's also forage chicory in this mix as well. So now I'm going to talk about a little bit of differences that I noticed with grazing behavior over the years. Goats like to graze with their heads up. This is some of the sets of goats we had that were grazing the, the uh, millet. Uh, lambs don't mind grazing with their heads down, although this guy has got his head up for the picture, which we appreciate, but 
He's eating the, the millet uh, just like the goats were. Our goats there love to browse the uh, sun hemp. Um, they would strip those uh, leaves off the sun hemp and just left, leave the stem. Uh, you can see a great um, picture that observing that. Um, and here's our, we have our lambs grazing that mixture that you saw the last perennial pasture mix that we have. They went in there and actually sorted out um, the clover the first time through. The second time through was predominantly orchard grass. Uh, the first time through they did a great job of sorting out that clover. I think that's one of the reasons why we had the dip in game. Uh, we had lambs that were on a grass only diet that went to a uh, diet heavy in clover. And I think we paid the price or they paid the price for that uh, during the second acclimation period, actually. One of the things that we, we found with our goat grazing behavior was this is the chicory field I was talking about. And you can see the Canada thistle uh, right in that picture. That's the before picture, and this is the after picture. Now, right away, people would think, well, that means if you have goats, um, you need to uh, get them, or if you have a thistle, you need goats to get take care of them. Well, that's not exactly true. What we actually noticed here, again, um, Susan mentioned we were in the shadows of Antietam. The goats were just like Robert E. Lee. They always want the high ground. And so they grazed that Canada thistle down because it was on that rock break, which was the highest place in the field. The Canada thistle growing in the corner of these fields did just fine, thank you very much. The goats ignored them. But that high spot, um, they really enjoyed eating uh, those thistle down. Uh, the other thing we noticed was they enjoyed eating mare's tail as well. Uh, this goat would eat the mare's tail as far uh, down as it could and then it would basically just like the, they would push the stem down with their chest and and then they would nip the top off of it. Um, here's my example. You can see the the amount of clover in there and then the next time through very little clover mostly grass. And again there's another picture of that hard to find clover in there the second time across that field. Part of that was because of the grazing pressure applied by the lambs and part of that was the seasonality of clover. It's usually stronger in the spring. Uh, this would have been early August. Uh, we had enjoyed a few showers of rain but not as much as we got the rest of the August and so the grass uh, was doing much better. So basically final thoughts, no one size fits all in, this, in a management scheme. And I believe if you're grazing, you should have a mixture of perennial and annual forages uh, to kind of smooth out those big bumps in the um, summer slump and, and some of those other times of year when we lose um, some of our forage quality and also forage availability. Uh, Michael, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm going to allow you to take any questions if there are any. Yeah, that's great. Jeff, that was perfect. And you came in short. That was great. You sort of made up for Susan, who uh, needed a little making up for. It. Speaking of Susan, the, um, the questions in the chat room right now really are all for you, Susan. So let's jump to that for a minute before we move on to Amanda. So we can catch the questions while your presentation is still pretty fresh in their mind. So everybody can see him, but I'm going to read the first one to you, Susan. Will future studies include soy hull, soy hull pellets instead of grain as a supplement? Uh, That's a great question. In the past, uh, when we had our goat test, we did some um, analysis of their feces that showed their diet was insufficient in energy despite plentiful and high quality forage. So we started supplementing and initially we did, we did do soy hulls. And because you know, soy hulls are a good balance with pasture since they're a roughage feed. Here's why we don't do it now. Uh, the person who asked the question, they may, soy hulls may well be cheaper where you live. Soy hulls are significantly higher cost than grain here. So they're not a, 
they know they are not a lower cost alternative to grain. Nothing's cheaper than corn or barley in our location. Could be different where some of you folks are, so it's not uh, cheaper. Uh, prefer not to have the choking that goes along with soy hulls. Uh, these lambs are being fed once a day and they're going to eat fast because they're looking forward to it, so we would probably get some choking. Uh, the other reason, another reason is because we are, we were able to get funding from the Maryland Grain Producers Utilization Board and funding is increasingly hard to come by. And so when we have an organization that's supportive of what we do, so I'm not going to say that that didn't have a, a little bit of an influence. So for those different reasons, barley is a more economical source. It allows us to, to apply it uh, for those funding we're not going to see the choking. As far as the grass-fed designation, uh, USDA no longer has a grass-fed designation. When they did, you are correct, soy hulls met those uh, criteria. But since there no, are no longer grass-fed definition, um, I don't think soy hulls are an advantage from that standpoint. They may be to your customer. You know, if you're direct marketing beet, meat and you're selling grass-fed, and, and your customers find that more palatable, then certainly that would be an advantage. So I hope that kind of answers all of those different reasons why we opted to go with barley instead of soy hull pellets. Okay, and Susan, the next two questions really kind of relate to one another. One is, do we not need the barley at all? Could we have gone just with the grass? Your data seem to say. The second of the questions relating to that is, could the timing of that supplement have been different? Would the pasture have been adequate at some point where supplementation would be more beneficial later in the fall? Yeah, you look at those pastures and a lot of it's backed up by the, the forage samples and the data that you saw and you say, well, it's crazy. It's crazy, they don't need supplementation. But I can tell you that, again, you look at that data, it's there. It's hard to understand sometimes, but even though there's plentiful forage and, and plentiful quality in terms of percent uh, TDN and energy, it's actually too much protein. And um, they actually sometimes are still deficient in energy. But at the same time, I'll tell you, that's the whole purpose of the study. The whole purpose of the study is to see if there was a benefit to that supplementation. And right now, I'll tell you, in our study, the jury's still out. Because at times, at, the, at times, the pasture-fed lambs were doing really well and looked really good. They don't now. And the, and, the, and the supplemented lambs have really come on. And they've been, you know, but you've also got to cover the cost of supplementation. So, so we don't know yet, but that was the whole purpose of the research. And then if you find out it's not beneficial, and maybe it's not, then what we want to do is say, well, what enabled us to finish those lambs on pasture? What enabled those lambs to do well on pasture? And so when you look at the forage data that Amanda's collected, that says, well, you know, these are the kind of pastures that can, that can enable us to finish lambs on pastures. And the other thing, you look at the parasite data um, that shows you that, you know, if you can keep parasites under control, uh, you can get the performance on a pasture-based diet. I can tell you that didn't happen with the goats. Um, the parasite pressure was too much. So, but again, the whole purpose is to see if supplementation is beneficial. Normally you supplement pastures when they're deficient in something. And so at different time of the year or a different location, they, they might be more likely to be deficient a different year. All of that's true. But like I said, the whole point was to see even on what we consider good quality pastures, is there a benefit to uh, an energy supplementation? After the, the pasture lambs crashed that first 11 day, 10 days, what Jeff calls the second acclimation period, we went ahead and put some hay out there to try to get some dry matter in their bellies. So, um, so yeah, but all the, but those, all of these questions are kind of, that's what we, that's why we're doing the study. That's the, you know, there's pros and cons and we're trying to see, see whether, whether it was worthwhile. And if it wasn't, what was it that made those um, pasture lambs do just as well? Those are kind of the questions we want to answer and kind of, you know. That's perfect, Susan. Jeff, are you there? Because we got a few quick questions for you as well now. Okay, I'll go ahead and quickly answer uh, the question about dairy goats versus meat goats. Really, if you think about it, a growing meat goat has a very similar uh, nutritional demand as a dairy goat. So other than, you know, I would plant the the, the very good 
pasture mix that we have right out there for the lambs right now. If you have the ability to add a warm season annual, then I would certainly consider doing that again, depending on where you're, you're located. Um, it's gonna be to your advantage, I believe, to add a, a millet. I would definitely add a millet. One thing I didn't share was we use a dwarf millet and one year our, one of our ag techs planted the wrong millet and we had to mow strips through our millet because it was too tall and the goats wouldn't go inside to eat it. Um, second one, yes, we do use an inoculant for cow peas um, and which one right off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you, uh, but we did inoculate those cow peas. Um, the question up here in NS, I'm, I'm guessing that's Nova Scotia. If it's not, it's Northern Scotland. I don't know where it is, but um, uh, but a good universal pasture mix, I would imagine if you're, if you are in, in um, Nova Scotia, then we're looking at cool season annual or cool season, per, excuse me, perennials. Uh, a pasture mix similar to what I have out there right now. And we do, um, there is my email address out there. If you email me directly, we can, more easily converse about a pasture mix. <clears throat> Last question here is, um, do you need a seed drill? Uh, not necessarily. Um, if you till, you can spread your seed with the cyclone seeder or whatever, and you can just roll it. Um, I've done that in many occasions, used the cultipactor, the roll behind, uh, you know, seeding, uh, broadcast seeding. Great. I think we're up and there. I think people might be interested in the comment about someone who said they're supplementing soy hull pellets with alfalfa pellets, um, which aren't so easy to find in this area, but um, sounds like an interesting idea and it seems to have reduced the choking issue. Does that sound sensible to you, Susan? Yeah, there, there are. Um by mixing them you definitely can reduce it um i know on my own farm i i have found that mixing i won't feed straight soy hulls i'll mix them with grain because of that um but you don't eliminate it and and i don't mean to overemphasize the choking thing i mean they don't normally die from it it's just kind of an annoyance that it happens because that soy hull sort of expands when when they eat it but but that's not like i said the real reasons that we opt for 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 feeding the grain is it's some more economical it's a more economical option for us. And like I said, it enables us to uh, get, you know, be competitive for funding with an organization that's, that's very supportive. Great, okay. We are gonna turn to uh, Amanda Greb for her finale. Now Amanda, while she's relatively new as Maryland's uh, forage and uh, pasture management specialist, she is already fast making us Maryland farmers forget the legendary Les Faux, who will never really be forgotten. But if ever he was, it would be because of you, Amanda. You've been great. So I turn it to you. All right. Um, thanks. Thanks, Michael, for that introduction. Um, so to kind of wrap up our um, virtual field day today, I'm gonna to be talking about uh, setting up a successful pasture system. So we'll be going through Kind of some of the key components to think about when you're um, setting up a system or looking to improve your existing system and then we'll also talk about um, how we do things at WIMRAC versus you know a few other options that um, you might want to consider as well the first thing that i wanted to say um, you know jeff kind of alluded to this was that grazing comes in many many different shapes many many different forms there are many ways to do it and there's never going to be a one size fits all system so just because you know we're doing something one way or another farm is doing something one way doesn't mean that it's going to necessarily be the best fit for your farm so um, my best suggestions are to keep things flexible as much as possible. Um, you know, flexibility is always an advantage and then keep it simple. Um, sometimes, you know, not overthinking things is the best uh, strategy. So the first thing um, that I wanted to um, kind of start with was when you're first putting together a system or looking for ways to improve, um, you need to think about why you want to um, use a grazing system or what your goals are for that. Um, what you're hoping to accomplish, 
you know, are you looking to do 100% pasture raised, all grass fed, or are you looking to do more of a hybrid feeding and grazing? Um, and if so, how are you going to handle that? Um, are you looking to just improve your pasture, whether that's yield or quality production? Um, are you looking to use pasture to reduce your feed costs? You know, there's a lot of different things um, that you can can try to to work towards with pasture. For us at Wimrick, um, for this year anyways, um, you know, you heard Susan talk about our study and what we've um, been doing for this past grazing season. And our main goals were, you know, we had to provide housing for two separate groups because we have two treatment groups. Um, they both need access to pasture, water, shade, et cetera. Um, both groups needed, you know, 24 seven access to pasture. And then the one group also needed um, access to be able to get that grain supplementation once a day. So those were kind of some of the, our goals for this year. The next big consideration is um, what your resources are. And when I say resources, um, this can mean a lot of different things. Um, we have fixed resources, of course, like how much land or space you have, the soil type that you're working with, existing buildings, fencing, infrastructure, um, water lines that may already be there or water sources. And then we have flexible resources or things that we can more easily change, you know, temporary fencing, water troughs, um, the, the amount of livestock can be a flexible resource, you know, your stocking rate, how many animals you want to have at any given time, and then your forages or vegetation, um, you know, it takes a little bit of time um, to do renovation or plant new things, but that is a, a flexible resource as well. So for us at Wimrec, um, we have uh, basically the following resources. Um, we have, you know, the, the big shelter and handling um, system, a shade area that, that you saw in Susan's videos and photos. Um, you know, we have this central laneway that we'll talk about to use for moving animals around. We have our existing forage mix, which you heard Jeff talk about. Um, you know, it's a cool season mix of grasses and legumes. Um, we have temporary fencing that we have. We use netting and we'll talk about some temporary fencing options. Um, we have uh, waters and mineral feeders, which you can see in that photo, um, to use for uh, providing water and minerals to our lambs. And then we have um, some grain feeders to provide that supplementation. Um, so consider all your resources and kind of what you have to work with. The next thing to consider is um, management options. How are you going to manage your pastures? Um, what type of management system do you want? And of course, this ranges from anything from something really simple up to something really complex or intensive. Um, you know, the simplest form would be a continuous grazing situation where you just fence in the entire area, put the animals out there and and let them have at it. You know, you can move up a step to like what we would maybe call a simple rotational grazing system where you subdivide that area into sections and rotate the animals between those sections. And you can make this as intensive as you want, you know, uh, more intensive where you further subdivide those areas and rotate those animals maybe every one day, every couple days. Um, some people even do, you know, twice a day um, or multiple times a day. So there's a range of options um, that you need to think about when you're setting this stuff up. One of the things with a continuous grazing system is we know that the animals are going to select what they like. So sometimes this leads to those good plants disappearing, lower digestibility stems or, you know, other undesirable forages are left. And overall, we know this has a lower forage utilization. Um, you know, maybe a little less than half of the pasture that's available is actually being used um, because of that. If we move into more of a rotational grazing system, we know that controlling the amount of time those animals spend in any given area allows the pasture, the forages, the soil, and everything to recover in the other areas, which automatically increases the utilization that we have. Um, so, you know, if you move up to a simple rotational grazing, you know, you're maybe um, bumping that utilization up and then up to a more intensive one, of course, increasing that even further. Um, at uh, Wimrick, at, at our research station, we kind of fall in this simple rotational grazing. Um, we'll talk in a minute about um, our system and, you know, how often we're moving them and the paddock sizing and that kind of stuff. Um, so when it comes to paddock sizing, um, you know, a common question that gets asked is, how large should I make my paddocks? Well, this really depends on which of those management systems you're intending to use. If you have a larger paddock size, um, this means you're going to be rotating them a little less frequently. If you have a smaller paddock size, they're going to consume 
what's there in that paddock and they're going to be needing to be moved more frequently. Um, so that will play a role into it. Um, in a perfect world, I would say um, kind of the ultimate goal or the gold standard would be to, to have them graze um, no more than three days in any given area because we don't want those um, animals to be going back and regrazing or biting off plants that have started to regrow. So after you know three or four days, a plant that was grazed off on day one may have started to put out some new shoots to regrow a little bit. Um, and if the livestock are continuously going back and biting off that new growth, that's where we get the um, detrimental effects to our uh, forage quality or our forage uh, persistence. Um, and then also from a parasite standpoint, especially for small ruminants, um, the shorter period of time and the longer a rest interval we can provide um, between returning to that same paddock, that allows us to have um, lower parasite pressure overall. So for us at um, the research station, like Susan mentioned, we have around 10 acres total. Um, so this means we have approximately five acres for each of our two treatment groups. We've divided our um, system into four paddocks for each of those groups. So this results in a, a little over an acre per paddock for our lambs. Um, this is you know, kind of a lot of space. I'll um, show a video clip in a minute that shows kind of how the size of a paddock. Um, you can see from this photo, they have plenty of room um, to, to, to graze and um, mosey about. We are currently rotating this year um, once a week, so every seven days. And this is um, for a couple of reasons. First, from a feasibility standpoint, um, none of us uh, are actually you know, living at the, the research station or at the farm. So um, from a commuting standpoint and uh, being there, um, that is a little bit easier for us to work into with our schedule. And the other reason is we also are really understocked. Um, you know, we have more forage really than what we need for these animals. Um, so that's been a blessing. You know, we have a lot of forage that's available to us. Um, so we're able to use a little bit of a um, longer rotation period and still accomplish what we want to. So here is a video clip um, just to show you kind of the size of the uh, fields that the animals are in. Um, and the first part that you see here, um, beyond that rock hill in the back, is what they were on two weeks ago. What you see in the middle there is what the um, sheep were grazing um, that current week. And then this was taken um, the day I moved them. So I had just moved them into this fresh paddock where you see them now. So you can see kind of roughly the size of those paddocks um, and also the effects of kind of that rotating. You see we have this nice fresh abundant um, forage supply for them in the paddock that we move them into. So when it comes to layout, um, there are a lot of different options. Um, you know, you see a whole bunch here on the screen, you know, you can make squares, you can make rectangles, you can make triangles, you can do different sizings. Um, and it is a little bit hard to um, decide initially, you know, how you want to set things up. Um, they have done research looking at these different um, shapes, you know, they require different area, different amounts of fencing. Um, some have laneways incorporated, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit, some do not. Um, but in general, um, a, a broad recommendation is that the more square you can make your paddocks, kind of the more efficient you'll be, um, you know, uh, from a, um, a utilization standpoint, if the water and the housing are, you know, say in the center of that um, bottom middle image um, and the, you're expecting the animals to go from there all the way out to the edges or in a really long rectangular shape, um, it, they've shown that there's a little bit less utilization, a little bit less uniform distribution of grazing across the field um, that way. So if you have an option, um, try to make them a little square or somewhat square if you can. Um, that being said, we realize that, you know, some farms don't really have that option. You know, at Wimrec, our fields are nice and square and we have, you know, things set up that way. But, you know, if this is your farm, um, making really square uniform fields might not be um, the right way to go. So um, one of the things that I really encourage when you're thinking about layout and layout options is to um, sketch out a plan. You know, um, what what existing uh, fencing or structures are there? What can go where? How can you divide things up um, according to um, how, your, how your farm looks? So if we were to do that for our research station, here is the overview of the 
um, the 10 acre fields. You can see um, you know, the, the left half and the right half with the laneway going up the middle. The gray box is our um, handling system and our shelter um, with a blue water source there. The red X's indicate where we have gates that can go in and out of these different fields. Um, so when we're setting ours up, um, the way we set it up, it looks kind of like this. Um, and a couple of things to point out, um, if we look at um, you know, the way we have these fences, um, one thing to consider is you know, we kind of want to make you know, these nice, um, even um, pastures. Well, if we would have drawn this fence line here and here instead, there is no gate here um, to get from our laneway into those fields. So, you know, we had to be a little creative and kind of angle these fences a little bit so we can have access from these gates into these two fields. Um, so that's another thing to consider about is um, gate placement and where you're going to be able to have access. Down here, um, we needed these two gates to be able to lead into two different fields. Um, so we have this set up so we can swing it this way or this way and same on this side, this way or this way so that we can um, you know, make our layout kind of flexible and adjustable um, how we need it to be. So um, again, this is kind of set up as a simple rotation um, we have eight paddocks total, four per group, with that central dry lot and shelter and laneway. Um, just to give you a few other examples of um, potential layouts, um, here we have something that would be, you know, kind of a step up from what we have at WIMREC. Um, there is, you know, this I would say is more of a moderate rotation. Um, there's like 26 different fields. Um, you can still see um, that uh, central laneway system right here. Um, the laneway going to all those fields here down here is the barn um, or your shelter, you know, dry lot kind of area. And, you know, same thing, they have gates going from this laneway into these different fields, um, but they actually have, you know, interior fences in here to further subdivide those exterior fields. And then you can see um, in that circumstance, they have to have water source out here. So when those animals are out here in this field, they still have access to water. Um, so again, another another consideration for that. And then, you know, if you really want to take it a step further, once you get comfortable with kind of a more complicated system, if you like how the way things are going, um, you can really, you know, take this to the full extreme. Um, this is a, a, a bee farm actually in Frederick County, um, and they have a total of 51 different paddocks. So, you know, this is a much more intensive rotation. They don't have laneways, so you can see based on the numbering, they need to be strategic about the order that they graze those fields in and how they move animals from field to field. Um, but again, they have kind of that exterior perimeter fencing and then, you know, some interior subdivisions to make those paddocks a little bit smaller. Um, so again, be flexible, um, you know, make it as simple or as complicated as you wanted, as you want, um, but start small, I would suggest. All right, so the, um, now that we've kind of talked about kind of overall layout and that kind of thing, um, I wanted to go over a few different considerations um, when you're making these decisions. The first is a barn, a shelter, or handling facility. Um, you really want to make sure that you have a spot where you can get animals back to a shelter if needed or a handling facility. Um, of course, for adverse weather conditions, you know, health considerations if you need to treat an animal. Um, ideally, of course, this is kind of in a centralized location, um, but work with what you have. You know, if, if you have it on one end of the field or the other, um, you know, start from there and, and develop from there. For the um, movement or laneways, um, laneways um, have some pros and cons. The pros are, of course, they allow for easy movement of animals between fields. Um, back to the barn, from field to field. Um, if we have water in a central location, like we do at our research station, um, we really um, need that laneway so the animals can go back and forth and have access to water. On the downside, the laneways do take up space. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard um, with erosion or, um, you know, you may not be able to maintain a good um, forage surface on those laneways. They do require a little bit of extra fencing. Um, one other consideration for laneways is you really want to make sure those are wide enough to get your equipment through. You know, if you're going to have someone come in and spray or someone come in and, you know, make hay on a field that, um, you know, you have extra pasture and you don't need it and you want to hay it, um, you really need to make sure that the gates are there, the laneways are wide enough to be able to get in and out of those fields. 
Um, and laneways can be temporary or permanent fencing. Ours is set up with permanent fencing, um, but they can be done with temporary fencing as well. So again, here is the set setup that we have at um, the research station. And here you can see um, how we have our central laneway system um, right here, kind of going down the middle. And then we have access where we, you know, we just simply have to open this gate and those uh, lambs have access to that field there. Here is a um, quick video clip from the other side. So you can see um, those lambs right now have access to the field with the open gate. If we were to take that temporary fence that you see and swing it over to the other side, we could have the lambs have access to the field there on the right hand side, um, just by, you know, moving a little bit of that temporary fence and opening and closing those gates a little bit. If we, um, on the flip side of things, were to close both of those gates and instead open these gates on the other side, we could do the same thing over there. We have a temporary fence dividing that field down the middle um, and we can you know, connect that temporary fence to one side of the gate or the other and have access to two more fields on that side. So that's kind of how um, our system is, is currently set up and you can see um, you know how we can provide access to those different um, oops, to those different fields here is um, you know a picture of you know how we use the laneway system this was a day when i think i was bringing the lambs in um, to have them be weighed um, so you know we just kind of they are pretty used to it they walk you know follow right up that laneway system it's very easy to to shuffle them around um, using using this system And then um, this is uh, just to show that, you know, they get pretty used to this and sometimes you don't even need to herd them, <laughs> especially if you're carrying a bucket, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll follow right along with you. I think I was actually going out to take forage samples on this day and um, I had some friends uh, follow me down the laneway as I was headed out to one of the fields to take some forage samples. Um, so they get pretty used to going back and forth. Um, and it can be a good way to um, help move animals around in those different fields. You can see they weren't afraid of following me at all. All right, so another consideration is um, the feeding areas so you know if there is going to be adverse weather if um, you know over the winter time if it's too wet to graze or if the pastures need rest they're not ready to be grazed again um, you really need a place that you can kind of house or keep those animals um, this can be like a dry lot or a sacrifice lot if you don't have one of those um, it can also be one area of the pasture that you designate kind of as a sacrifice field um, realizing that it may get a little bit more beat up than you would want it to um, if you have a lot of um, mud problems, you can always install, um, you know, better footing or high traffic pad maybe in, in those areas. Um, we use our kind of central shelter system as this. Um, and you can see that, um, oops, I don't know why that popped up. Um, you can see that here, oops, nice. uh, we actually have two gates back there. Um, that we can use to shut the animals into this um, kind of sacrifice area or shelter area if we need to. Another thing to consider is access to shade. Um, not every paddock might need this, you know, if you're kind of rotating frequently and you kind of time it. So um, on cooler days, maybe they use the pastures that don't have shade and otherwise on the hotter days, they use the fields that do. But um, in a perfect world, each field or each paddock would have some sort of access to shade. For us, the lambs are always able to come into that central shelter system um, so they can get shade there. Other options for shade, you know, are things like trees, wooded edges, um, three-sided shelters in some of the different fields, uh, no-sided shelter, a shade cloth. Um, there's a lot of different options for providing shade. Um, just something to think about. Water can be one of the most um, limiting factors in a grazing system. You know, how do you get water out to all of those remote fields? Um, really, there's kind of two types of Watering options, one is more a portable or temporary options, um, which kind of are really only usable in the summertime or in the warmer months. And then there are fixed or more permanent options that can be used year round. Um, a good uh, point to note is to make one water source serve several paddocks, um, whether that's because of a laneway or a central setup like we have, or if you have water that you know crosses the fence line, so you can provide it on both sides of the fence line, 
This just means you have to have fewer water sources, fewer valves, fewer connections, etc. Um, summer watering options, of course, you need some sort of permanent source um, to, to provide that water. Usually, um, summer water options have, you know, some sort of above ground piping or hose. Um, they can be either manually refilled, which is what we do. We just have a, um, a spigot and a hose and we are there every day, you know, to feed them and check on them. So we fill up the water whenever it gets low. Um, or, you know, you can put in something that has more of an automatic valve and will kind of automatically replenish as needed. Um, so here's what we have, um, you know, those lower water troughs that are portable, easy to move around. Um, we just fill them up as needed. Um, here is uh, an example of something that would be um, kind of another summer watering option. You can see it's using all hosing and above ground piping. Um, but this one is connected to um, a watering system using kind of those automatic valves. Um, here he's just showing you that uh, the, the piping runs above ground. So this is not really um, feasible for winter because those um, hoses could freeze or those pipes could freeze. Um, but there's a quick connect valve um, and you can, you know, simply um, move your trough around, plug that into your quick connect valve, and then you have a water source that will automatically refill um, whenever the livestock drink from that watering trough. So you can see the, the valve in there with the floaty um, that will shut off when it gets full. Um, here's just a still image of um, that same thing. Um, you can also bury that piping so it's um, below ground instead of above ground, which will you know extend the length of time that you'll be able to use it a little bit, um, you know, depending on how deep that's buried and how cold it gets in your area. In the winter, of course, we need a little bit more of a permanent setup, um, have to be buried below the frost line and use a frost-free trough. Um, in this circumstance, of course, the central location is easiest and the most inexpensive to install. Um, and you can put that you know, in a few different areas or in a central um, feeding area. We don't have lambs at our research station over the winter, um, but this is an example of something that you could use um, you know, as a winter watering option, a, a frost-free um, trough. One other thing for water to think about is um, access to water. And, um, you know, in this, this kind of comes back to the paddock layout and setup, you know, you do want, um, you know, multiple access points to water for, from different fields in a perfect uh, situation, but also there is a certain extent to that. You know, if you have 15 different fields all linking to the same water source, a, it gets really crowded near that water source and B, you know, the, the ground gets really beat up and eroded and kind of overutilized in that area near the water source. So um, think about that when you're setting your system up as well. All right, finally, we have um, some different fencing options. Again, we have, you know, permanent fencing. That would be more um, sturdy, durable, a little bit more secure. And then temporary fencing, which is usually used more for kind of interior fencing and subdividing. This is you know, easy to move or easier to move and offers a lot more flexibility uh, for moving animals around and changing things as needed. Um, these usually require electricity. You can you draw power from the exterior permanent fencing. Um, if that's an option, that works really well. Here's what our fencing is um, for our exterior fencing at Wimrick. Um, we have a high tensile wire fence that um, has a charge on it. Um, so that's what we have for our exterior fencing and also along our laneway. Um, another option would be something like a woven wire fence. You know, they make these with or without a top board. There's also board fences, um, other things that are permanent. Then you can move into maybe some semi-permanent fencing options, which would be like T-posts um, with either wire strung between them or woven wire. Um, this is a little bit more portable. You know, those T-posts are um, still movable, but a little bit more permanent than um, than um, electric netting, um, which is a good temporary fencing option. So here's what we have at, at the research station. We use electric netting to subdivide our fields. And you can see that photo in the bottom left. Um, we just connect that electric netting to our um, perimeter fence. And that's what provides our charge to provide electricity for that electric netting. Um, this is portable. It can be, I will say, a little bit awkward. Um, to handle or move, you know, a little bit hard maybe to push in the ground if it's really dry and compacted soils, um, but it, it is a portable option that can work. Here's a 
uh, just uh, to show you the flexibility of behind those temporary fencing, this is actually um, Susan's house. And you can see that um, you can get creative and you know graze your lawn using those uh, temporary fencing options because they're easy to move around. Um, other temporary fencing options are you know poly wire or tape. Um, again, these are easy to handle or maneuver. Keep in mind you know the spacing or the height if you have um, young lambs or um, animals that are a little bit more deviant. Um, you need to keep that hot to provide that electric power um, to keep those animals um, respecting that fence. There are a lot of different um, spacing and heights to consider, um, usually for uh, small ruminants, you know, sheep, goats, um, and the like. You are going to have something that has a little bit more wires and has more wires closer to the ground, so they're not able to go underneath that. You can see um, those two kind of line up well with what we have um, at the research station. And finally, um, think about the opening size. Um, you know, you don't want um, animals to be able to stick their heads through and then get stuck. Um, so either make those openings, you know, big enough so they can easily stick their head in and out, um, electrify it so they don't do that, or make them smaller so they're not able to stick their head through. So to kind of wrap all of that up, um, basically, uh, you know, work with your existing and your permanent resources. Um, I highly suggest uh, first installing a secure perimeter fence, a boundary fence, and then using uh, flexible options for your interior. You will find that as you start doing more rotational grazing, you might want to move the way you think have things set up. Um, so if you can keep the inside really flexible and, and easier to change, that's always a good thing. Um, think about those resources, access to water, shade, um, etc. Again, grazing comes in many shapes and forms. Flexibility is key, so decide what's going to work for you and um, be willing and open to, you know, changing that if you realize it doesn't work down the line. And start small, you know, keep it simple. If you have one large field, maybe divide that into two or four, two to four sections and rotate between those. That's already going to offer a huge improvement over a um, one large continuously grazed field. So um, start small and, and take baby steps. I did put my contact information up here if anybody has any questions. Um, we do, we will stick around to do some questions now uh, for those who are interested in doing some Q&A. Um, I do have a couple of housekeeping things um, to share with you kind of before we get into the questions. Um, the first is, let me, um, if anybody, um, if you are willing, um, we have this um, poll. Oops, I want to do. We have this um, kind of follow-up poll um, that, if you would be willing to just answer, I think it's six really quick questions. Um, it would be really helpful to us in, you know, figuring out if today was helpful for you. Um, you know how we can change things like this to make it more helpful for you in the future. Um, that kind of thing. For anybody who has um, a um, who is here from Delaware and um, is looking for Delaware um, nutrient management credits, um, I do have a, a Qualtrics link that I will put um, in the chat box for that. And then the final thing is um, we also have with us on the call today um, Dan Reed, who is. Um, Oops. He is from the University of Maryland uh, Center for Environmental Science, and he's trying to um, do a uh, survey of all the events that are happening in the region, um, the Mid-Atlantic region, to understand um, basically how um, how they vary in. Um, in participant engagement um, and you know your experience as a participant with different uh, events that may be going on and you know kind of help to uh, again guide us as you know extension and as a university in developing programming that is um, helpful for you so i will share the link to both his form and the um the qualtrics survey the qualtrics survey is again just for nutrient management credits um, for delaware um, if if that applies to you so with that, I guess I'll turn it over to Michael and um, you can start rattling off questions. Yeah, okay. Well, we have two for you, Amanda, to get you started. Um, one is um, one of our 
viewers would like you to go back to the slide that showed the different paddocks um, formation so that he could take a picture to use, but it, it illustrated different types of paddock formations. And while you're doing that, there is a question for you. Um, let me just see which one it was that seemed, um, uh, Okay, the building that you use for watering and shade, um, they wonder does the manure need to be cleared out during the season or annually, or how do you do it? And is any kind of bedding used in there? Um, so uh, I was not there when that was set up. Um, so if Jeff or Susan have anything to add to this, um, they can feel free, but um, we right at the moment only have basically a dirt floor in there and we don't currently clear out um, manure from that on a super regular basis. Um, I think it's scraped um, kind of more on an annual basis, like when we have one group of lambs leave um, and then, you know, everything is empty for the, the fall and winter months. Um, we might clean that out, you know, before we bring in the next group the following year. Um, uh, but we don't do any like regular, um, you know, manure removal from that um, during the season, or at least we haven't this year. It's currently a problem. Uh, I'm sorry, Jeff. Um, um, it I'm get, correct. Yeah, but it's it's a problem because it gets too wet in there, and these are sheep. And last year we had wool lambs in there, and we wanted the pelts, and they got pretty dirty because. You know, rain never happens when you want it to happen. And so it got rainy and wet right near to slaughter, which even if we weren't harvesting the pelts, you don't want lambs to get dirty to slaughter. So I think it's something we're gonna have to um, address. What we're currently doing, current personal opinions is not working. And I'm gonna let Jeff address with what he thinks we should do in the future. Yeah, there's several ways of dealing with, with our situation. Uh, one, one thing we're looking at is, is the old style um, California dairy barn where you, where you put a ridge, uh, a humped ridge, and then you went in there and, and scrape it or till it um, periodically. The key, right now the drainage in that barn is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so we're kind of we're kind of leaning in that direction right now. The other options, of course, are uh, a heavy use area where we would put gravel and, and a fabric liner. We've kind of stayed away from that um, just because of the fact that uh, we're not sure what how the sheep will react to that as far as their feet go. Uh, another thing is we concrete is just not an option because we don't want to scrape it all the time. Was this the slide that the um, whoever asked about that was looking for? I don't believe so. I think you had okay. one that showed one where there was water system in the middle with spokes coming out, and then a couple of different ones with. Oh, this one? Yes. yes. Okay. The, okay. Yeah, that was the one I think made sense. Yeah. So um, there are a number of new questions. Um, and I'm going to throw this one to Jeff, really, but it, it's thrown out to everyone, but wondering if anyone is grazing other animals, um, and in this case, they were saying chickens, and what was the order? Do you graze the sheep, throw the chickens in behind? So, Jeff, you probably have talked to a number of farmers using chickens. What do you think is the sort of the best rotation system there? Typically, folks who graze chickens, they graze them behind the primary grazing animal. I don't mean to disparage chickens. I've raised them most of my life. Um, so by saying something else, the primary grazing animal. But typically, that's the way it works, uh, especially small ruminants, less so than with cattle. But the main reason of following them with cattle is moisture uh, is what allows uh, fly larva and the, typically the Chickens will spread the cow pie out, if you will, by scratching in it and drying it out and then reducing fly um, pressure. 
And in addition, those that they miss, they'll go through and eat maggots and other things. So typically it's a, a leader follower with the chickens following. Okay, well, I think that captures really most of the questions. Um, do any of the three of you, Susan, Jeff, Amanda, have any fault in sort of finishing comments? I guess I'll start. Um, if some of this work interests you that we've been doing, either this year's study or past studies, um, the information is available. I, I put a little bit of stuff in the chat box, but we have a blog for the current, well, we have a blog that was started when we ended the goat test that covers the research that we do now with the lambs, starting with the comparison of the ram weather and short scrotum lambs, and now with this year's pasture supplementation study. We did a blog for the meat goat test, and while that ended, when the test ended, the blog is still there, all the information and all the posts are still there. Uh, the Maryland Small Ruminant page, which is sheepandgoat.com, if you go under programs, if a lot of the, we've done a lot of carcass work. We're really disappointed that we can't collect any uh, actual carcass data this year, but all of that data is, is there. The, the study we did for four years where we compared pen fed versus pasture raised goats, that data is there. The buck test data is all summarized as well. So if you wanna learn more, uh, the information is available on the blogs. It's available on my website. I also have a very active uh, Facebook website or a Facebook site, and Amanda also has a Forages Facebook uh, page as well. So that's where you can find additional information on on uh, any of the research that we've that we've been doing. And you know, and research is a learning thing for us too. Uh, this year, like I said, it's getting kind of unusual, and we're you know we're we're going to repeat the study, and we're going to need to see you know do we need to make some changes or what's the best way to go about it. We need to make it similar enough so that it's a repetition of this study. Uh, usually, you know, uh, to quote one of Jeff's phrases, re, you know, um, now I can't even think of it, but you want to replicate research, you know, and so we're going to do a very similar study next year, make whatever changes we think might be necessary for animal health, because we've had, we have had, well, we've not had parasite issues this year. We have certainly had animal health issues this year. And so maybe trying to figure out how better to, or to anticipate and how to deal with those things. So research is, is, is a learning process. And this project's not over. No conclusions whatsoever can be drawn. We're going to weigh them one more time. We're going to scan them. And then we need to look at, look at the data and uh, hopefully try to figure out, you know, what happened and, and, and go from there. But I thank everyone for participating. I thank my colleagues and I thank Michael for um, moderating for us today. And everybody stay safe and healthy. Michael, they can ask a predator question. What, oh, oh, so I didn't hear that, Jeff, but did you see my, I, I just typed in that someone asked about predator control there on the farm. Yeah, we don't have any predator control other than our fencing. Um, and that's not by necessarily our design. Uh, that fence was bought, built through a, um, a con, uh, a con, an NRCS project, so there's seven wires, all hot. Uh, we do have coyotes around that farm. I hear them at night, uh, but we have not lost one small ruminant goat or lamb to a coyote as of yet. Is that your final comment, or do you have some wisdom, some additional wisdom for us? Well, I mean, for I'm not, I'm not saying what we do is the right way to go from that perspective. But you know, folks need to figure out what's right for them and how much uh, predator pressure they have, and whether they want to use a llama or a donkey. Both are very effective. A guard dog or a guardian dog, um, they are effective. I know Susan's used. Um, Great Pyrenees, um, a friend of mine uses llamas, another friend of mine uses donkeys, uh, one of which I wouldn't trust. I won't go in the field without, without him. So there are um, certainly methods uh, to, to utilize, but know what your predator pressure is and then uh, choose accordingly. And Amanda. 
Yeah, I put a, um, someone asked for the links to the Facebook pages. So I put in the chat a link to Susan's small ruminant page and my forage page. Um, so those are there if anybody um, needs it. And then someone else wanted to verify if we were recording today. Um, so we did record um, today's uh, session and you know, it may take us a few days to get it like downloaded and coordinated and re-uploaded, but we'll let everybody know um, once the recording is up, I can send a follow-up email to everyone who registered with the link to the recording. So that will be available to you. I think mm -hmm. that's all I have. Otherwise, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, we hope, hope it was helpful.